Welcome to the Artistic Finance Podcast, where we break down the wall between art and money. If you're here looking for how to be an artist and financially sustain a career, you're in the right place. Keep listening and join us as we learn about artists and how they make money work for them. Hello, everyone. This is your host, Ethan Steimel, here for episode 27. Thank you for joining us, and a special thank you to my patrons and to anyone listening from France, the home country of our guest, who is comic book creator Miguel Guerra. His latest comic book, Ghost Metal, just released for Halloween and is a collection of horror stories and is available for free at sevenrobots.com. To learn more about Miguel, check out last week's episode where we talk about his personal finances as an illustrator. Today he joins me again to discuss MMT, Modern Monetary Theory. If you're here for a discussion on art, I'd suggest you skip this episode. But if you're interested in money, currency, and debt, you'll enjoy the discussion. Miguel and I had a blast talking about this, but that's because we're a little bit nerdy when it comes to money, currency, and the historicity of it. Okay, one tiny request before we get started. Please find Artistic Finance on Apple Podcasts and subscribe. It helps me reach more listeners. And the same for Miguel. Find Seven Robots on Webtoon and subscribe. It's free and it helps him find more readers. We both thank you for subscribing if you do, and we thank you for listening to our discussion on the highbrow topic of MMT. Without further ado, let's get to our interview. Welcome, Miguel Guerra, to the podcast again. Pleasure to be here. Today, we're going to have a discussion on MMT. I've now had about 30 or so people on my podcast, and most of them are very progressive, liberal-leaning people. And zero of them have ever heard of MMT. (laughs) Yeah, you know, that doesn't surprise me. Um, But anyway, continue. (laughs) Yeah, well, it surprises me a little because I've known about MMT for at least five years. Right. I really came to it around 2007, Mm 8. There was a financial crisis. Right. And the fiscal conservatives spent billions of dollars, just suddenly just created money. And then we went into quantitative easing. And and no one cared. And so that was sort of like, that just sort of raised, you know, just made you think like, wait a minute, the party that says they're good with money is the ones that are spending all the money. (laughs) It's almost like a power rule. You set the standard, you get everybody else to to, to live up to the standard, and you don't live up to the standard. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I would say you're more forward thinking than I am, but I'm pretty forward thinking myself. Right. Anybody listening to our discussion will think, okay, these guys are extreme progressive people talking. Right. And I would not say them nay. But I do want to say that everybody in America, no matter what party you're affiliated with, once everybody in America to have a good life. They want a good quality of life for everybody. Right. Democrats want funding for the public and the private sectors, and they want to make a social safety net available to everyone. Republicans, they want funding limited in the public sector, but they want massive spending in the private sector. They want businesses and charities to be doing the social safety net. And I'm not saying that either way is right or wrong. Mm -hmm. That's just sort of the consistent message that we get from both parties. I would say the reason that the Republicans want a lot of money in the private sector is because they have a lot of investment in the private sector. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I looked up some stats before this just to prove my point or reinforce my point that everybody wants good. And so Pew Research, uh, their 2020 stats say that 63% of Americans want universal health care. Yeah. 91% want the post office. 79% want the Center for Disease Control. Right. And 77% want the Census Bureau. And the IRS that every American dutifully hates. Yes. (laughs) 65% of people want the IRS and think that we need it. Wow. Wow. (laughs) So that's combining both parties. And it's just to say that the citizens, the people, actually want a good society. Yes, yes. And I think that that, that a lot of times what happens is there's been a very clever way that has deflected from that. And I would say probably goes back to 1676. You have the Bacon's Rebellion. Bacon's Rebellion, you have 
poor indentured servant uh, Europeans. They didn't call them white at that point yet. You have black people uh, who are both enslaved or, you know, they might be free or whatever, get together and they said, we're tired of this corrupt governorship of Virginia. Granted, we want to take land from the Indians, but <laughs> we get have cruddy land. So they rebelled. And after that, they decided how we're going to split this up. You can see in the record as how, how they do it. Fast forward to today, they choose cultural issues. They're not talking about fiscal and whatever policy. For the left, it might be, you know, gay rights, whatever it might be, whatever it might be, you know, which is not a bad or a good thing, but it's a way to sort of deflect from, wait a second, I don't have healthcare. I don't have all these things. So I think that's been a very clever way that they've managed to do that. And every once in a while, like, oh, that's spending. Right. You know, so. MMT gives us the framework to understand that it's not a money issue. It's just an explanation of how the world is operating. Exactly. Okay, so I have Investopedia's definition of MMT. Do you think I should read it? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I mean, you, know, you could read it if you you could read it, I guess, for, for, for listeners in case they're kind of like... Yeah, I'm, I'm going to read it and then I might cut it out later because it's sort of hard. But anyway, okay, so this is Investopedia's definition of modern monetary theory. It is a macroeconomic theory that for countries with complete control over their own fiat currency... Government spending cannot be thought of like a household budget. Instead of thinking of taxes as income and government spending as expenses in a checkbook, MMT says that fiscal policy is merely a representation of how much money the government is putting into the economy or taking out. So this means that any government spending can be paid for by the creation of money with the purpose of taxes being to limit inflation by controlling the money supply, this means that spending shouldn't be determined by deficit levels, but by whether or not spending is keeping the economy at full employment and at a reasonable level of inflation. Right. It's great definition. I get it. But I think it's, it's, it's harder for, for the people. Pretty much it's like governments make the money. If they control their, I mean, like, say, for example, Greece or Spain, they can't do that. You have the, you know, the ECB that, that is the one that does it, you know, in Brussels. You know, if you're a state, you're a local government, you can't do that. that. That's the limit. They have to work within the budgets that are given to them. If you're a federal government and you have your, your ability to print your own money, yeah, you're sitting pretty, but, you know. The federal level is different than the state and city levels. Mm -hmm. The household theory, that does apply at the state and local level. You do have to balance a budget there. But at the federal level, they have to spend and they have to create the money for any money to exist. Right. Oh, well, another thing is I think we're in the MMT era already. Yeah. For the, at least the last 20 years, at least since 2001, when it's like military budget, whoop, go up. <laughs> well, what's, what's interesting you say that well, there was a period of time where people would talk about China and how much China owned of our bonds. Only 30% of our bonds are owned by foreign entities. 70% of it is owned by the actual government, us. It's us who owns it. The banks and yeah. Even if China leaves, they only make up a small percentage of that 30%. It's not really going to affect us. So I think there's been a lot of illusions. And the other thing, because everybody always freaks out that the Fed is making money or creating money out of no nothing, banks do too. A lot of people are under the impression, and I've seen this because I had a poll, it was really sad. I said, so do you think loans are taken from savings or is money created out of thin air. And overwhelming amount of people thought that it's due to the savings that you put into the bank, <laughs> this loan. So you have money creation happening in two ways. You have the federal and then you have the banks. So crashes are, could be quite common because there's these factors we're not taking into consideration. Actually, that's sort of a good point, and I might be oversimplifying it. Uh, reminder to everyone that you and I are not economists. <laughs> no, we're not. We're not. <laughs> The guy that writes my comics, Steve, the prof he's an economist. Check out Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I am not. But, but in the U.S., how do people get money? Because remember, the United States government creates the dollar. So how does it get those dollars to people? You can either be a federal employee where you're getting paid or you can be on Social Security and actually get the dollars from the government. And then the only other way is for a bank. A bank buys dollars and then the private sector or people, us, we go to the bank to get our loan. A business gets a loan so they can pay their people. 
those are the only ways that you can get dollars. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's the only two ways. Yeah. It's, I guess because it's so common for us, we just sort of think that it's just natural, that it's always just there. Warren Mosley said, uh, said the gentleman that, uh, I don't know if he created, but he's the main guy for MMT. He said, what do you think? They just tax you before they actually put the currency out there? No, you put the currency out there and then you tax it. Yeah. Okay. So I read that definition of MMT, the technical definition. Do you want to get a, give a stab at just sort of describing it? Could we cobble together an explanation of what is the idea? I guess you could say money creation. Money is created first, then taxed. Simple. Not tax creates the money for the spending. The spending comes first. So that's why you can't just, oh, we're going to tax the rich. Because once you take that money, it disappears. You can't just give it over to someone else. You have to spend money into creation. So you go and you spend it on whatever programs you want, whether it's left or right, whether if it's military or healthcare. And then as you start to generate, uh, whether it might be businesses, whatever it is, then you start to tax. The reverse. Taxes are still there, but it's just flipped around. We have monetary policy, which is the Fed. Right. They create the money. Yep. They're supposed to keep employment steady, to keep inflation steady, and make steady economic growth. And then you have fiscal policy, which is Congress. They decide how much money we need. I also wanted to say that money is not evil. Money is an imaginary thing. Once you know MMT, you can't say things like, I want to pay teachers more, but the military is more important. They need the money more. And you can't say, well, let's tax the billionaires so that we can fix the potholes in the roads. No, you can't do that. Yeah, because the way that it works is that, and uh, Warren Mosler pointed this out. He said, you know, first you spend the money. So you put the money out there. Then you tax it and you use taxes to drive the currency or you use taxes to get rid of all the extra stuff that is making the, the economy go wild. But people have been drilled into their heads the first you tax. That is not the way that it works. And it's not even a theory per se. It's, well, I guess you could say it's a theory, but it's a way of explaining the operations of how it actually is done. Yeah. To your point about money not being evil, I know a lot of people always misquote the Bible. They always say the root of all, no, no, the root of all evil is the love of money. Yeah. A lot of people really don't understand too. Graeber explained it beautifully. I mean, if you've read debt the first 5,000 years, if you haven't, read it. You'll never look at money the same way because he goes into explaining to you uh, how it's debt, all this debt stuff. I mean, he, he gets into, <laughs> you know, now it makes me think, you know, like sins literally were debts. Uh, Michael Hudson, who I did a cover for, uh, for his and forgive them their debts, he goes right into the Bron Bronze Age and he talks about Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia could figure out, okay. What's going to happen is we're going to lend out all this money. All this interest is going to happen because it's not really money. It's credit. Uh -huh. and credit is the first thing that comes. Yes. And then what's going to happen is it's going to be impossible to pay. So they created Jubilee. So you had periods of Jubilee. So he goes all the way up and then you get to ancient Greece and Rome. They stopped having Jubilees. Why? Because this fictional thing, math, I mean, sure, you can have a thousand percent, but are you ever going to pay that? So I think it's really hard then to think and, and to realize and I always laugh when atheist friends of mine say, I don't believe in anything irrational. I say, well, open up your wallet. Because <laughs> the first thing you will find is one of the most irrational things that hinges this entire mega structure that we call civilization. And it's money. And it's really hard for us, I think, to give up that belief. Because once we give up that belief, then we realize, as Graver points out, this is plastic. We can actually mold it to something better than what it is. Yeah. It's really hard for two reasons. One, you believed in it because your parents told you. Two, you feel really stupid. I think that brings up a point, which is fiat currency. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people understand what fiat currency is, but it's what the US dollar is. Right. It's not pegged to anything. Correct. It's not pegged to anything. So people, I, I think everybody knows, but still we think in our brain that the dollar is pegged to gold or something like that. Right. But it's not. It, it was before the world wars, and then, you know, we needed to pay for the wars. So we said, oh, not pegging to the dollar. And then after World War II, we pegged it back to the dollar again. And then Nixon said, need money, so unpegging from the dollar. Well, what happened was, it was um, de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle did not trust that he would get his gold back. So he called back his gold reserve, which just blew up Brenton Woods. 
because he was saying you guys are spending all this money on Vietnam and all this stuff, which is kind of funny considering France pulled out of <laughs> Vietnam <laughs> and said, Hey, you might not want to go in there. And they're like, ah, whatever, you know, we got it. you got occupied by the Nazis. What do you know? Right. So, and then we went out and found out it was just a fool's errand, but yeah, it was, it was uh, because of that. And then they had to deep de peg it. That just says that we're not being facetious or crazy. The dollar is backed by nothing. Yes. Actually, the most interesting thing anyone has to do is look up the root word for, because I said credit came before money. Look up the root, the Latin word for where credit came from, which is credo. Credo means belief. Yeah. <laughs> That's why it fluctuates. You know, if you honestly sit there and think that the market is rational, that there's an invisible hand balancing things out. No, it's just a matter of like, presence got sick. Okay, I'm going to dump this much. Why are you doing that? He might recover the next day. You know, it's all faith. So, you know, some people know this, but I'm assuming a lot of the people listening don't know this, but there's Keynesian economics which is what we use to get us out of the Great Depression. Right. And the idea behind that was increased government spending and then lower taxes to help get the economy moving. The next thing I think most people know is trickle-down economics. Oh, Reagan. Yeah, which is sort of a supply-side theory that wants less regulation, give more money to businesses and investors, and then everything will work out in the economy, which we all sort of know is like doesn't work, but I think our brains are all still there. I think Milton Friedman was the most dangerous one when he won the Nobel Prize and that whole thing that we now call neoliberalism was really refined and the Chicago boys and that whole, as Naomi Campbell called it, the shock doctrine came in, that changed things a lot. And then by the time you get to Reagan, you know, you have the uh, coup in Chile. And once you get to Reagan, that just gets really ramped up with him and Thatcher. Yeah. Because Thatcher was another one. I mean. Right, Thatcher. So you get the, those two and, and we've been suffering that and it's been neoliberal policies and people confuse neoliberal, like, you know, J.K. Rowling has her own problems. But <laughs> once I saw that she said something about, oh, yeah, I'm a neoliberal, like it's centrist. It's like, no, just because it has neo doesn't mean it's a political philosophy. You know, it's a, it's an economic policy, although it, it translates into a political policy. You know, the idea of privatizing everything. Okay, that was something I missed. Maybe you can explain it a little bit. But Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher is who you're referencing. Mm -hmm. And why is she important? She's important because she was pretty much uh, rolling out a lot of the same stuff in England. Uh, a lot of the privatization, a lot of the things that now is basically put the... <laughs> The UK. <laughs> I know a lot of people fall in different ways over Brexit. I usually say, you know, Brexit you should have had was from Washington because now they're walking in and they're going to privatize the NHS. I mean, they're, they're, they're fighting to keep their health care. Europe's health care is in danger because for American policy and the way that they're looking at it, American citizens are saying, well, why does Spain have health care? Why does, you know, France have health care? So they're probably thinking, well, you know, to cut down on this nonsense at home, we should go over there and roll it out. That's just speculation. But in terms of England, Boris Johnson went into the hospital. He was sick with COVID, came out, applauded the nurses. A week later, he's back to cutting the health care. She plays an important part because Boris Johnson is very much cut from that Thatcherite way of thinking. Yeah, and, and I'm going to interject that the, the Thatcherite way of thinking is taxpayer money is what funds the government. And it's that household budget situation of whatever we tax is all that we can spend. And therefore, what we can't spend, then we'll just privatize it and let the private sector uh, deal with it. The government has a thing that a household doesn't have. <laughs> it's called a printing press <laughs> or a keyboard, right? So yeah, okay, the private sector, like, that's what people love to do here in the US is like, oh, let the private sector deal with it. But you can only spend United States dollars. Where does the private sector get the United States dollars. It can only get it from the United States. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, it's kind of funny, isn't it? Graver, I, I, I laughed out loud. You know, I grew up Catholic, so sort of thoughts cross your mind, but he, he brought up something in debt the first 5,000 years, and that is, you know, when you think about it, Jesus dies for our sins, but then Jesus is God, so he's literally dying for himself. So he points out how how that sort of weird logic then applies then to money, where one generates the money <laughs> and it goes right back to it. It doesn't make any sense, right? If you think about the way that they're 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 doing it with the whole household thing. And they really got a lot of people believing this 
Because if you're sitting in a household, you're like, yeah, well, you got to budget things. It makes sense. Right. But if you have a printing press, it changes everything. So. The one part of MMT that confuses me because it's a little over my head, it's a little too highbrow for me, is inflation. People say, well, if you can just print all the money in the world, what about hyperinflation? I don't have a simple answer for it because there's a lot of ways to control inflation, taxes being one of them. But I want to say to the hyperinflation situation, quantitative easing under Bernanke, under the Obama administration, they put so much money into the economy and inflation did not hyperinflate. Well, it was interesting. It didn't go into the economy. It went to the stock market. So the stock market, it was just basically keeping all these big companies afloat. Had we had a jubilee or some sort of, uh, as Steve calls it, a money injection into our accounts, everybody would have paid back their debts. And then it would have literally gone into the economy, but it didn't go into the economy, it went to the stock market. Just like recently, they just dumped a few trillion and it evaporated in seconds. It just gone. So part of the, the helicopter problem is that it's not going to us at the bottom. It's going to the ones at the top and it sort of sits there and circulates there. This is actually just a fun, funny note for me, which is people said Bernanke was throwing out money from a helicopter. And what they were saying is he's just giving money, like you're saying, into Wall Street, just insane of money, just making it up, putting it out there. I, I actually think if they took helicopters and threw money like at people, it would have been better for people. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Because I think, you know, like I think most most of us just want to pay back our debts, right? No one likes being in debt. I mean, that's just like the worst feeling ever. I think if it, if it would have been that, and if you had any extra because you weren't in debt, you get a prize. That prize is in your bank account. I remember hearing a, a saying in Colombia, the money always goes back to the bankers. Always. <laughs> I mean, there's just such a tremendous amount of greed in the system and, and just selfishness that it's there going to the people who was going to to the few companies. And it's just really sad. And, and that's why I made that point earlier of everybody in America wants good for the country. Like they want their fellow citizens to have good quality of life. We Everybody wants everybody to like have a house and a car and a garage. I mean, the country is built on divisions. So I think those divisions come in quickly. I mean, there's an African uh, African myth that Joseph Campbell talked about and I think pretty much illustrates it. So there's this, this trickster God who paints himself on one side red, on the other side blue. And he decides to walk down through this small village and people are looking out their windows and they see this God. So on one side, they're seeing him red. On the other side, they're seeing him blue. So once he disappears, people come out, they start talking about, oh, we saw blah, 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 God. Yeah, he was red. The other people on the other side, no, he was blue. So people start arguing. <laughs> and in very many ways, it's, 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 it's still the same being, right? In many ways, this, this discord allows for 600 people to run our country, right? And instead of saying, wait a second, uh, you said that we couldn't make money out of thin air. The other thing that I think has to be understood with money is that people confuse money and currency. Those are not the same thing. Money is the math of a debt. Currency is the representation of that said debt. So I think it's also understanding those things we need to know. I want to bring up the national debt because that's always the big thing. Our debt, we have to reduce our debt. Can you speak to that? Yeah, you know, there was a time when I used to go by the... Uh, down, downtown and like downtown Manhattan. I, mean, I lived in Brooklyn, but I would see that and I'd be like, whoa. And now I kind of think we have a magic printing press. We can take care of this. I mean, even I think it was Obama or Bernanke that joked about the trillion dollar coin. It's because they, they understand that it's abstract and symbolic, much of it. The other thing that has to be understood, and I, I like to compare, if you took public debt, it would be like the size of, say it's the size of the moon. But if you took private debt, student loans, credit cards, mortgages, all that stuff that doesn't have a printing press to take care of it, it would be like the sun. We're sitting here worried about something that can be relatively solved, while there's other things like this massive debt that literally could collapse everything um, in, in many ways. This is what crashed Rome. This is what crashed Greece. Their debt got so huge and they got such a small oligarchy that eventually it just couldn't manage itself. It's picking and choosing. And if you ask me, public debt's more dangerous. I mean, private debt, sorry, private. Yeah, just to reemphasize your point that the national debt could be eliminated with a keystroke from the Fed. Yep, just blip, blip. You know, I mean, they just came out recently said, oh yeah, we just create more money. How? We just hit a keystroke. Yeah. 
Another thing, too, that it's not Republican or Democrat is that Alan Greenspan was the chairman of the Federal Reserve for almost 20 years, and he is famously libertarian. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. He was one of the sort of like to tie the art thing with the uh, with the finance. Steve Ditko, the guy that drew Spider-Man, the original Spider-Man uh, comic, and Alan Greenspan were at the same first meetings with Ayn Rand. They're a libertarian. So yeah, yeah, he, he is big time. Like not just like, I just walked into it. Like he heard Ayn Rand talk. So well, and, and Alan Greenspan was under oath at, in Congress. And he was asked about Social Security and is it going to run out of money? And Alan Greenspan, the libertarian who doesn't want any government whatsoever, he said, ah, oh, yeah, the Fed can always just pay it. <laughs> like he, yeah. he said that under oath in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know that, but that doesn't surprise me. It's it's pretty wild. It's like this boogeyman. And then we argue over this boogeyman. But if we didn't argue, I think they, they, they'd have problems. Here in France, it doesn't matter who gets elected. They're going to protest them. That's just the way it is. So, And it's kind of funny seeing CNN talk about Macron. But as soon as Macron got in, a lot of people were like, well, we have Le Pen. She's a fascist. And then we got Macron. He's a neoliberal. But Macron got elected. Boom. Next day, they're protesting him. They're out in the street. You know, stateside, it's just like, well, you know, I'll vote for the lesser two evils, but then you don't protest them. Right. Right. Yeah. We have to do more, <laughs> I feel. Anyway. Yeah. Um, but anyway, people should take away from this that the national debt is not something to worry about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. Yeah. Your credit card debt is something to worry about. Student loans are something to worry about. Your medical bills, because the reason we get in credit card debt is because of the massive amount of debt that we get in from healthcare. And with COVID, I was reading there are people who got a million dollar bills. That's obscene. That's obscene, you know. And I know I'm probably going to anger some people about this with Joe Biden, but when he came out and said universal health care did not save Italy or Europe from COVID, uh, I tell you right now, no one's walking around with a million dollar bill. <laughs> a million dollar bill, which for this imaginary money. The world is still operating, whether that bill gets paid or not. Yes. And the other thing is, too, there's other myths, too, associated with money that how it was first came into uh, whether, um, you know, cultures develop it. A lot of times there's the barter myth and that David Graver just, just hate with passion because anthropologists said we've looked at various cultures, many cultures. Never once did we ever see anything to do with barter. It never existed. But favors and credit, that exists. Actually, I'm so glad you brought that up because that is a thing. Everyone's always like, oh, yeah, back in the old days when people bartered. No, it never it, it never on a substantial level existed. Sure, you swap something with somebody. It wasn't really how the economy worked. Only time you see it is when empires collapse. You might see it kind of creep up and, yeah, it's like, no, I'm going to give you a third of my cow. No. It's like, <laughs> hey, can you paint my house? Okay. You know, like maybe, but, you know, it's, it's, it's really, and this is from mainstream economists that still talk about this stuff. So I'm going back to the national debt because I obsess over it. <laughs> All right. No problem. No problem. <laughs> it's just to talk about people are scared of it. Like there's this thing of like, oh my gosh, we're X trillion dollars of dollars in debt. We're never, our children are never going to be able to pay that off. Okay. Say there is a national debt. Say the Fed creates a hundred million dollars and it taxes back 90 million. So there's 10 million that it's in debt. Like it owes, to, there's 10, there's 10 million unaccounted for dollars. But the thing is that $10 million is in the private sector. By the U.S. having that $10 million dollars that they're missing, private citizens now have money in their bank accounts. I'm just saying that to say that's a good thing. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. It is. And this is going to sound completely, absolutely insane, because I know that usually you say to the right of Genghis Khan, if anyone has read their Jack Weatherford books, will know he was actually pretty interesting. One of the accounts is that he walks into Baghdad. He sees all this poverty, of course, after he's conquered, but he sees all this poverty. He sees these beautiful palaces and he's thinking the wealth needs to circulate. This is a nomadic guy out in the middle of nowhere understood that, hey, no, if you're pulling all this money, this is bad for society. It needs to circulate. This idea that we have, and it's interesting because Jack Weatherford, um, he's an anthropologist. He helped translate the secret uh, history of the Mongols. And he did another one called Fantastic Book, uh, different topic. It was on Native Americans, what the Native Americans gave to us, uh, Indian givers, what Native Americans gave to us. 
He has a theory that we have tribal versus sedentary societies. And that most oftentimes the tribal societies end up sort of giving us all these wonderful new ideas to the sedentary societies, such as, well, <laughs> feminism, Iroquois nation. You have uh, the Iroquois confederacy that gives us all this wonderful stuff that today we think is just came from ancient Greece. No, it was a lot of the indigenous people. And it's really fascinating, but it has to circulate. So if you have those $10 million, we as private citizens, we're not going to keep it in our pockets. We're going to spend that money. Especially if you're Miguel, you're going to spend that money. <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to go right back to them. It has to be like a circle that we're thinking of. Anyway. So. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a good point because there's a book called The Deficit Myth by Stephanie Kelton. She talks about how tax cuts, because that's like a divisive thing of like, oh, the Democrats are going to tax and the Republicans aren't. Taxes are necessary. Once again, 65% of Americans think the IRS is necessary. But it's, it's, she's talking about targeted tax cuts. You need the money to go to the bottom 20% because they're the ones that will have the biggest impact because they will spend it into the economy. If you give it to the 20 top percent, they are just going to buy more stocks or more bonds. They're not going to buy. They're already going out to eat every night. They already have the cars they need. They already have the house they need. They're not going to go buy another car. But the bottom 20%, they will go out to eat instead of going to the grocery store. They will go get a vaccine that they're missing that they need. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you're right. There was a, I can't remember which billionaire, but actually came out and said, look, I'll never spend this money in my lifetime. And cars? I've got all the cars that I want. I mean, you've won the video game. I mean, like at this point, you're like, you know, you've done second, third, quadruple laps. You know, it's the people who are still fighting in the video game. It's like the jokingly think of it kind of like a Matrix video game sort of thing. When you think of it, money being made up. So it's the people who are at the bottom of the video game and level zero or negative zero, <laughs> you know, that need the help to get to level one or two or whatever it might be. That is true. There is like a group of, it's either millionaires or billionaires. But there's a group of them that are sort of lobbying Congress to be like, you know, we really should have our taxes raised. <laughs> there's, there's still there's still a lot of paranoia here in France about uh, they still remember the French Revolution. And every once in a while, they'll, they'll lay you a good French Revolution joke. They're like, yeah, Miguel, we still know where the guillotines are. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the wealthiest people here, I remember when the crash happened, asked to have their taxes raised because I think they were... <laughs> they're a little, little worried. Yeah, we would rather you not come for us physically. Just take that imaginary money that's imaginary. We'll, we'll, we'll take the cut cut, but not that kind of cut, right? So, <laughs> and I can tell you, like, uh, I've been by um, Place Concorde, which was where they, they, they killed the king. You know, there's five places where they had the uh, guillotine. After one of the protests, I'm walking, and someone had writ written death to the king. Like not too far away. I'm like, man, they don't forget. <laughs> so you don't want a situation like that. I mean, it's always kind of hilarious to joke about it, but it's usually a bad thing when society gets to that point. You want to get ahead of it and you want to make sure that everything's nice and calm. And when you look at Mesopotamia and you look at Egypt, like Marx wasn't able to fit Mesopotamia and Egypt into his revolutionary sort of history. And the reason was they had debt forgiveness. This is something that Michael Hudson came. Yeah, it was like, okay, yeah. That's are forgiven. All right, start over again. Once you remove that, then you start having revolutions and all sorts of problems. Yeah, and I think that's one of the good things about MMT is it, it takes the excuse of money away. And it says, what do we want society to look like? Because money is an imaginary thing. Everybody blames, but you need to stop that as an excuse and talk about what is the society that you want. Because we can make it, the money is not a thing. I totally agree. I blame the pathological. There's a sort of relationship that we have in a very pyramid style structure where the most pathological make it to the top. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, that they're sort of Lex Lutherish, but they're selfish. Let's face it. And then there's codependency from the rest of us who believe that this person made it up there because of whether it's God or they're super hardworking, luck's not involved because if that is, then YZ up there, right? And there's a certain relationship. So once you remove money out of the way, now we have to start to evaluate that relationships that we have from bottom to up. Yeah. Um, there's something else I wanted to talk about, which was a federal jobs guarantee, which I don't know if that's part of MMT, but I think it's a way that MMT says in, in times of a crash or a depression or a recession, if you have a federal jobs guarantee, this will sort of soften the blow. And, and basically all it's saying is there should be jobs that if you lose your job, 
sure, we can have unemployment insurance, so you can be on unemployment for a while, but we should also have jobs available in local communities, wherever you live, that you can go get a job, you know, whatever the minimum wage is, or, you know, whatever, at some, at some base, because then you're keeping the money and, of course, spending it to live, so you're keeping money circulating in the economy instead of just being removed for however long until things come back to normal. Right. And you're still generating a, a work experience. Yeah. FDR did that back in the day. He had artists and other people too, that they would pay and stuff. He, he tried to revive it. So there's a lot of policies that FDR had that uh, unfortunately what happened was with the new new deal is that as soon as he put it together, there was already a plot to dis dismantle it. So by the time we get to the 80s, Reagan is the end result of that plot to destroy it, ultimately. I mean, there was a point, and this sounds crazy, but you can look it up, the business plot, which was to overthrow FDR militarily and put a fascist government. So everyone's talking about fascism now, but you go back, it was 1934, they got Smedley Butler. <laughs> Didn't work out their way because uh, Smedley came out and said, the top families came, you know, a representative from them came, to try to get me to do this, and this is what's happening. And he wrote probably one of the best books in terms of war. War is a racket. It is absolutely fabulous because he is still the highest decorated Marine in U.S. history. And he literally says, Capone had nothing on me. I, you know, I was a heavy for Wall Street in Latin America, Asia, and so on. So it's very important to understand that a lot of our imperial exploits is also tied with that whole war machine. And if we were able to take back our money and be able to then control it, those exploits would go, I would hope. Well, talking about FDR, with the Works Progress Administration, they had something called the Federal Theater Project? I think so. And he had stuff for, for painters and uh, other people. Yeah. I exactly. Um, Orson Welles is a name that most people know in America. He got like his start, or he got plenty of work and sort of got fame from a lot of the stuff that he was doing from the Federal Theater Project. Well, I didn't know that. I, yeah, it doesn't surprise me. I didn't know that. Yeah. And I'm a lighting designer, so there's also lighting people that... It, it was like early stages of lighting, but like our founders, they got their start like working with Orson Welles and working on all these projects. Those people wouldn't have had that, or maybe they would have done something else like farmed or, or been an economic person or, you know, whatever. <laughs> My father was telling me about, I think it's the Scandinavian countries. If you're an artist, you get paid a certain amount. I believe. I don't know if that's still the same. I might have been in the 70s or something, but you get a certain amount, even if you're not selling. It's a way of trying to keep you doing your thing. There are many ways to do things. It's one of the things, if you haven't read Debt by David Graeber, I would advise because after at the very end, he really poses the question, we really can shape our own society. It's just really up to us to decide how we're going to shape it. G gives you, it's like, and you're like, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> you get to that and you're like, yeah, I mean, it's pretty plastic. So yeah, I guess what I sort of take away is that we need people to have money. That's the key, which of course, I know I always draw back to the national debt of yes, be in debt, because when you're in debt, that means the people have more. If you don't have any debt, that means the people are indebted to you. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. You, 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 you. Governments cannot have savings accounts. Yeah. I think that's what people have to understand. There's not a savings account. You create it it goes beyond the borders of the United States. I'm American, so of course I care about America. Like, I care about myself first. You know, I'm selfish. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like 70% of the currency in the world is the United States dollars. This affects other countries. If, if we have debt outstanding, that means other countries have things. They have food and medicine and emerging economies actually have things. Whereas if we balance our budget, then those countries just stay underdeveloped. To a degree. I mean, you also have to consider that a lot of the loans that we lend out are predatory. So there's that whole other side to it. I mean, if you didn't have the predatory loans, you didn't have a lot of our bases. Yes, absolutely. But everybody affects everybody because, you know, we might be buying whatever it might be that they're producing and so on. For example, the, the Global South has desperately needed a, a Jubilee going back to the set, and they have not been afforded that. A lot of the not moving off of oil has been, and this is something that I kind of cracks me up about the environmentalist groups because they always talk about, oh, the carbon, the carbon. And then you look at our entity called the U.S. military, they measure petrol in gallons per second. And then there's a sort of weird vicious cycle. So we need the oil for our military. 
<laughs> and so on. So there's this other vicious cycle to it. So we have to include in our military exploits, which I fear appropriately so from what happened to my mother's country, Spain. The Civil War was really a result of uh, its imperial exploits imploding in on itself. And there's actually some really hilarious stuff like, and I, I you know, my, fought, my grandfather fought for the, the Republic. At this one point, they needed tanks and weapons against the nationalists who were the fascists. They had Hitler and Italy and everybody on their side. They took 510 tons of gold, gave it to the Russians in exchange for tanks that did not work. <laughs> no, the funny part is that is that if you really think about where they got that gold, you know, not that I believe in karma, it's sort of like, ah, <laughs> there's a punchline, right? You didn't get it when you, you didn't get what you needed when you needed, right? We have to sort of bring in those military exploits, I think, to sort of balance those things out when we talk internationally. Yeah, I agree. And this is conspiratorial of me, so I'll probably just cut this part out. But Gaddafi in Libya. Yeah. Yeah. He had to, he was a dictator. I'm not defending anything bad he did. Yeah. But he did make Libya the richest country and he was working on making a pan-African currency. He he had like 7 billion dollars worth of gold that he was using and he was going to give an alternate to the French franc and then suddenly he had to get destroyed. <laughs> he had to go. Yeah. And he also had or Libya still has the biggest water clean water reserves in Africa. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at the list of dictators that we, we sponsor, that's why I kind of sort of like cringe when I heard Kamala Harris say, well, you know, Trump cozies up to dictators. I can go to Wikipedia and look at a list of all the dictators, including my mother's country, which was a fat dictator, Franco. <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about? It's just the hypocrisy of it. You don't have to mention it. <laughs> you just fell out of favor and they just decided, no, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but the conspiracy in me is like, oh, yeah, he was trying to take monetary sovereignty, so he had to go. <laughs> it's all about the money. I mean, conspiratorial these days is like if you believe that the elite are shape-shifting lizards from the ninth dimension, right? Yours is within reason. <laughs> Yeah, mine mine actually has like cause and effect, which is, you know, correlation, causation. Back with some fact, back, back with facts, you know, uh, so yeah. I mean, the same thing could be said about Saddam too, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also want to talk about entitlements because I feel like a conversation about MMT is saying, oh, so there's just money. And this is why I touched on the federal job guarantee because it's like you give people an option to work for the money. And so everybody feels good. Not to mention it keeps it local. Like social security is an entitlement. And it's something that we as a society have said, this is something we need. Like at some point, people shouldn't need to work anymore. Like when you get old, you should be able to live in our country, but not have to work. And so we all agree that we want that. Right. Yeah. Entitlement always makes it seem like, because you're paying, you're paying for it though. And the other side too. So there is that, you know, it is being taken out of your, your, your check. So I kind of, understand when i always think entitlements is kind of like the queen you're born into it and and, and i think ent entitlement always gives the right just the perfect phrasing to say yeah entitlement <laughs> <laughs> right and then it makes it very easy to go yeah i don't know that, that sounds very high flutin we shouldn't have it yeah but but i think i mean it is one of those things that bothers me there's there's certain words that people are like scared of i could call it something else like i could just call it social security <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. Yes, yes. But but once again, it's one of those things that everybody, regardless of party, you want that because you want to live in a society that wants to take care of old people. The, the most recent thing was Trump did an executive order to diminish but extend the pandemic unemployment insurance. In doing so, he cut Social Security funding. But people are like, oh, he cut Social Security funding. He cut the taxes for Social Security. So Social Security is going to run out of money. That's not the case. Taxes don't fund Social Security. Social Security exists. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I guess I look at it from the function of how the average person looks at it. It's kind of like how I feel about even like race sometimes. Well, a lot of the times. We know scientifically it doesn't exist. But when you go to fill out your birth certificate, mind you, there's only two other countries in the world that ask that on your birth certificate. It gives a certain validity to it. So when you see social security tax being taken off your paycheck, you look at it and you believe that it's it's real. And that's probably one of the other problems. But uh, yeah, absolutely. If you're talking from an MMT perspective, it's, it's a non-issue. But the average person, their perception of how they view something, yeah, that's the problem. So maybe even just 
having the social security tax as as it's stated is also an issue. Actually, that's funny you say that because in Stephanie Kelton's book, she talks about FDR and how they purposely put the tax on to the document so that people would feel good about themselves thinking that they had paid for it. That's hilarious. But eventually, after so many years, it backfired because then people were like, well, we can cut the tax and then therefore, oh, no, we're cutting Social Security. So it was sort of like a mind game to make people feel entitled to <laughs> the benefit they were getting. Oh, wow. Didn't and make them feel that. good about it. Wow. <laughs> That makes a lot of sense then. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So yeah, from that perspective, you're totally right. Yeah, it's entitlement. <laughs> <laughs> but once again, if you understand, in America, you can only use the United States dollar to pay for things. Where do those dollars come from? The government. So unless the government puts money out, it cannot be used. Like it has to start from them. It has to come from somewhere. It does not come from the taxes you pay. Yeah, we don't create, we were not the ones that create the money into existence. But yeah, no, that's interesting that you bring that up because uh, about the social security, that it was just done as a gimmick. So that's that's interesting. I did not know that. That makes sense. Well, I have to I have to pick up and, and uh, read her book when I get a chance, but I'm not reading about werewolves. Uh, yeah, re yeah, yeah. Get information from an actual economist. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, I've, I've been reading a lot of Steve's and Michael stuff, and uh, so I have, to, I have to. It's on my list of books. Okay, I feel like we've done a pretty good coverage of it. We've at least talked about it so people can understand. Since I've run into thirty progressive people who had no idea what it was. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what warps your mind, though. And it, if you understand that if you read Graver's stuff, read Steve's stuff, Hudson stuff, Kelton stuff, then you start realizing we're insane. We're <laughs> <laughs> then you don't take either either side seriously. You know, you have one side saying, oh, we're going to save this much money. And you're like, no, you're not. You, you create the money. And the other side, oh, they're going to spend this much money. And then you feel extra crazy, but you're telling other people who are plugged into that way of thinking they're not going to see your way. Oh, and before we go, I do want to mention, I might have made this point already. You and I are fairly progressive people. MMT is being proposed by progressive people because that's always how things advance. MMT, the concept, the idea, is just explaining how the system is working. It, it has been working this way for at least 20 years. We are in what I consider the MMT era. Yeah, I mean, just take money itself. It's kind of scary to say that it's made up. I think that makes it kind of hard for people. And that it's tied to religion. That's the other thing that's really hard. And this is my last aside. The name yeah. for money comes yeah. from the Roman temple, Juno Moneta. The temples okay. were where you stashed, they stashed their gold, whatever it was. Uh, Michael Hudson, that was working closely with the people translating the cuneiform from the Mesopotamian temples, overwhelming amount of the cuneiform were loan contracts. So it's so fused with religion that we've somehow secularized something that is <laughs> based on belief. For us to wrap our minds around, this isn't, you know, like you drop a ball and it's like physics, like, you know, we can actually touch it and stuff. This is, we collectively make the rules. Oh my gosh. Miguel, I am so happy that you just said that <laughs> because my poor wife, she gets so annoyed at me because I tie everything in the world back to religion and money. No matter what, you can start any conversation like, wow, this is a beautiful day today. I'm going to loop that back into religion and money. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want her to know she's listening to this, that you brought that up. You said that. I did not do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, it's my fault. It wasn't your fault. It was my fault. I did it. So. Okay. And, and also I just, okay, a final thing, which is going back to the MMT, us being progressive thinkers is just that MMT is how it works. It can be used for a progressive platform, and it can be used for a reactionary platform. Republicans can use it to say, oh, let's pay for the military. And then Democrats can say, let's use it for a federal job guarantee. It can be used both ways. So even though it's being proposed by the progressives, it works both sides of the aisle. So it's just the way it is. It's like a hammer. It's, it's just a tool. It's, it's nothing, more, uh, nothing more than that. So yeah. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. But the thing I want people to take away Treating things like a household budget only works at the state and local level. Correct. Or country, depending on what country you're on, the country or city level. Yeah. On the federal level, the household budget does not apply. 
you can never say how are we going to pay for it because you always have the answer MMT. <laughs> right, right. You literally call up the, the Fed. Fed says, well, how much money would you like? <laughs> how fast can you type on the keyboard? All right, uh, Miguel, thank you so much. Is there anything else you wanted to say? Just please check out my comic on Webtoons, Wolf Boy. If you like it, subscribe it, like it, whatever it is, but please. Okay, amazing. And also, I, I'm sure people realized it, but you were like the perfect guest because you are an artist and you make comics and you make those comics about money. <laughs> yes, about money. Yeah, it's sort of strange that the whole idea of uh, superheroes. I mean, it's just that that kind of got me thinking. How do we teach our? How do we tell our children altruistic lies? And then they get older, and then you have to pay for everything. I mean, you know, at least start telling them the truth from when they're little, and maybe they'll decide it shouldn't be that way. For me, it wasn't a matter of it should be that way. It was a matter of sort of like protesting the idea that. Millionaire is not going to put on a costume rundown. I mean, he might. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but there's that whole class issue associated with it, too. A rich guy beating up on poor people. But, you know, and I love that stuff but <laughs> from a religious point of view. All right. Anyway. Well, Miguel, thank you. Thank you so much. I really loved both of our conversations. That was our interview about MMT. My takeaways were taxes don't pay for anything. They just remove money from the public surplus. MMT prioritizes resources and people, not businesses. Businesses are designed to maximize fiscal profit, so they benefit executives, owners, and shareholders over workers and customers. MMT is the way our monetary system works, regardless of politics. It seems like a forward-thinking idea, but it is already used by all political parties. Money is transcendent. Paying back debt seems like the easy moral choice, but if you pay that money back so that someone can use it to cause harm, is it the right thing to do? David Graeber, who Miguel mentioned wrote Debt the First 5,000 Years, uses the example of if you borrow a sword from someone, and then while you have it, they become mentally unstable and want the sword back to kill someone, do you return the sword? I don't have an answer, but that's an example to illustrate the gray area that exists. Well, congratulations to all of us for sitting through a highbrow discussion. I hope that we all learned a little about MMT or see money in a new light. We just scratched the surface of the topic. And again, we're not economists or financiers. To learn more about MMT, read Warren Mosler's book, Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds of Economic Policy, or Stephanie Kelton's The Deficit Myth. Mosler's book is free in PDF form online. I'll provide links in the show notes and on our website for all of these books. Thank you again to Miguel Guerra for the lovely chat. Find his artwork at sevenrobots.com and subscribe to Seven Robots on Webtoon. He will be very thankful when you do. And if you're feeling generous with the currency that is created by the Federal Reserve, the IMF, the ECB, and the Bank of Japan, the currency that is then earned by you, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Do that at patreon.com slash artistic finance, where you can become a patron for as little as $3 a month and gain access to our shows early and with bonus content. And if you know someone who you would love to hear on our show, let me know by leaving a comment in Patreon or on YouTube or on Instagram. That's it for today. Until next time, break a leg. Thank you for listening to Artistic Finance. Find more information on our website, artisticfinance.com. Please subscribe to our podcast and please leave a rating and review. Artistic Finance is produced in New York City by Nicole and Ethan Steimel. Producing consultant Anne Nigrin Doherty. Graphics and website by Josh Cutler. Music by Chong Liu. Music by Chong Liu.